Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, um, I'd like to start by, by, by thanking Her Excellency for what I thought was the most inspiring and inspired speech that really sets the tone and the stage for the kind of conversation we're just about uh, to have. But first, je voudrais souhaiter à tous uh, dire bonjour. Bonjour. Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Are we learning? Wow, what a question. It almost sounds like a threat. The truth is, of course, that we all learn a great deal, and I certainly learned a great deal this morning from, uh, from this keynote speech. Uh, and we learn a great deal in the course of our professional careers and throughout our lives. We learn from our successes, and unfortunately, for most of us, we learn even more from our failures. Um, or so the received wisdom goes. The fact is that when it comes to organizations, very few of them actually learn and learn from failure. This is one of the rather depressing conclusions that is made by a recent study from the Harvard Business Review. Unfortunately, all too often, uh, our efforts lead to nothing, to no change. And it's not because, and we've just heard it, we don't believe, and we don't believe very strongly in the importance of learning. We do. And I think, as Her Excellency pointed out, in an industry as challenging as ours, which is the development industry, learning is not an option. It's a necessity, an absolute imperative. So why is it that we're not better at learning, and what can we do about it? To help us answer these questions, I can't think of a more competent uh, panel than the one that we have with us today. And not, I hasten to add, because they're familiar with failure, they're not. But because, as we've just uh, heard, uh, the panelists have given a great deal of thought to the whole uh, question of learning and what it takes to, to learn. None of our panelists sitting with us uh, this morning actually need an introduction. In fact, uh, Minister Nikosazana Glamini Zuma is so well known that she's sometimes referred to just by her three initials. NDZ is an anti-apartheid activist currently serving as minister in the presidency for the National Planning Commission for Policy and Evaluation. Her Excellency, as we all know and we've heard, is the former chairperson of the Africa Union and no stranger to large organizations. Caroline Haider is senior vice president and director general of the World Bank's independent evaluation group. Caroline has dedicated at least, I think, 30 years, uh, the last 30 years of her career, of your career, Caroline, to understanding and evaluating the work of development organizations. And what is interesting is that, Caroline, you've pioneered a number of innovative ways to turning evaluation into knowledge. And we'll be finding more about that in just a few, a few minutes. Per Basto is the evaluation director at NORAD and is responsible for evaluating all aspects of Norway's development policy. He's also the chair of the OECD DAC network uh, for evaluation, uh, uh, an organization that basically sets the standards and criteria for all, for all evaluators and for all evaluations. So one of the questions we'll be asking uh, uh, Per in just a few minutes is, are we asking the right questions? And um, Hannan Morsi, hi Hannan, uh, is the director of the bank's department for macroeconomic policy, forecasting, and research. 
She is a renowned public policy expert and has provided economic advice to many governments around the world. And last but not least, Pierre Guislain, Vice President for many things, including infrastructure. And I'm not sure, Pierre, in which capacity you will be intervening today. Will you be intervening as a president? I can't see the bow tie, by the way. Or as more probably the Vice President, and we'll be learning a great deal from, from Pierre. So with those few words of introduction, can I ask you uh, to give our palace a very warm welcome. In the course of the next 90 minutes, I think it's 90 minutes, uh, Karen, but you'll have to confirm, what we'll be doing is really trying to unpack this question as, are we learning? We will try and better understand what it, what it takes to become a learning organization. And uh, Minister, I, I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. I think you suggested a list of very important items that I think are essential for the learning, but we'll, we'll have an opportunity to talk about that. So we really want to understand how we can turn our organizations, turn countries into more, uh, more competent at learning from failure and successes. Um, and we're going to tease out, I think, and try and tease out from this conversation some important lessons for Africa. We've just heard what it means for Agenda 2063, but also, I think, as much as possible, because this is what makes it a lot of sense for, for the African Development Bank. What I'd like to do, and I need your help for that, is to make um, this session as interesting, as dynamic, as interactive, and inclusive as possible. And the way that I suggest we do that is that I'm going to give all of you an opportunity for two-hand interventions. What does that mean? It means basically that if you hear something with which you violently agree, you violently disagree with, that might be the case, or more generally, if you just want to react to something that you've just heard, then please lift both hands up. And what I will do is I will then give you the floor and provide you with an opportunity to make a comment or to challenge one of the panelists on what you've just heard. Uh, so uh, with that, um, I suggest that we start with a first round of questions. And I would like to kick off this conversation by asking all of you, in turn, um, the same seminal question. Are we learning? And if we aren't, why not? So that's the first question. And maybe to kick off the session, um, I'll start with you, uh, Caroline. I'll try and switch around so that I can see you a little bit better from where I am. Um, and, and, and start with you. I know I just said you mentioned many years of your career thinking about this issue. And uh, so we're very interested to hear your, your answer to that question. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Minister. It was a very inspiring speech. Um, so I want to start out with a much broader perspective and not immediately dive into one institution, the institutional constraints, but really look back at the 30 years that I've been trying to um, do this work um, and understand better how we can promote learning for progress, for change. Um, I think human beings, so since uh, Simon asked us, are we learning, we asked him beforehand, who is the we, and he left us uh, to us uh, to decide. Um, we human beings, I believe, are learning, but we are learning in ways that is very focused on the new, the curious, the sort of new technologies, etc. When we have to learn from the past, it is more complicated. So when you just think about uh, experiences, whether it is climate change, uh, whether it is social transformation, um, we human beings seem to have a problem to look back and, uh, and learn from that. Um, I am German. I look at uh, my country right now. And I am dismayed to see um, the tendency towards more right-wing uh, demonstrations, uh, which was unthinkable when I was a child and when I was going to school. 
Um, now, I have not studied the issue. I do not know. I have not evaluated why this is so. But um, from all of my other experience, I do believe that in order to learn for a profound change, one actually has to face the pain of failure. And most people and most institutions try to avoid that pain. Failure hurts. I have gone through very painful experiences, but invariably I've come out a lot stronger. But it is not something that people seek and want to undertake. And I think that plays a very large role why it is so much easier to learn forward-looking things, new things, whether it's technology, new languages, arts, whatever you have, but not so much to, to look at, back, um, back at experience. So when we think about institutions, it plays a role in that context as well. Um, in addition, institutions get compounded by a, their own culture. Uh, I have worked with many different international uh, organizations, um, the IFIs, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, IFAD, UN organizations from UNDP, UNIDO, World Food Program, so development, humanitarian, etc. Each institution has its own culture, and that's a good thing. But each institution it deals with information and feedback differently. Um, and very often, or actually I would say invariably, all of them have something that people refer to as the system. So collectively, the machinery, the way we interact in the institution holds us back from uh, actually uh, learning and changing. Quite often, people would engage with an evaluation and say, yes, I understand that, but it is the system that makes me do this, and therefore I can't change it. And so I think if we really want to get to the root cause of how do we learn in institutions, that is an entry point that we have to address. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. That was, that was most uh, interesting. Um, I'd now like to turn to, uh, to Her Excellency Minister Lamini Zumini, who unfortunately will have to leave, as I understand, in, in about 20 minutes, 11.45. So I thought we may take this opportunity to be asking you a few questions. Um, I, I was listening very carefully to what you said, uh, Minister, and uh, I thought that you outlined some really important ingredients um, in what it takes uh, to really learn from the past and learn from experience. And what you told us, I think this is what I took out of it, is uh, uh, you said there are seven things that really matter. One, having clear priorities, in particular work, uh, with regard to the African Union. You need the resources to support the priorities. You need the institutions to make things work. You need to evaluate or take stock on a regular basis. We need to be working together, and this is something that you very much insisted upon, we need to consult the beneficiaries so that the policies that we're implementing make sense for them. But also, as I understand, as we consult, we'll also design policies with uh, much, much more effectively and efficiently than we would have otherwise done. And the last and the seventh thing that I really like, you said, we need to dream big. So that sounded to me like a very good sort of recipe uh, for learning. Uh, so I'd like to turn to you, Minister. Uh, do you have a sense, or in the case of the African Union, your experience, that we are learning? And if we're not, what, what is getting in the way? Uh, thank you very much. I think the answer is maybe yes and no. Because I think we're doing a bit of both. I think we are learning both from the past from our failures, because if we, if we look at how we have tried to structure Agenda 2063 was based on what had happened to our previous plans, what were the things that were not uh, in place. And in particular, uh, the consultation, but also the buy-in of member states to incorporate what has been agreed into their own plans, but also to interact with citizens, both in terms of whether, what, what they would like to see, because the, 
the Africa that Agenda 2063 wishes to build will be the Africa they'd be living in. So we, we can't leave them behind. And we, we've also learned um, that um, short-term plans are, are a problem. They should be there within a longer vision. There should be long-term plans, and then you can then break them into shorter periods. Resources are, are very important, and I think one of the things that we haven't learned sufficiently is that we must fund uh, our program. In our, we, we must learn even from our culture, because in most cultures in Africa, when you're doing something traditionally, you, you invite others to help you. But you don't invite others to help you and then go away and say, you do it. I'm not, I'm not going to be here. You lead and they come and help you. So what we haven't learned sufficiently is that you must pay, put the first dollar and then other people can bring their dollars. But sometimes we think the first dollar must come from somewhere else. And then think when the first dollar has come from somewhere else, you will be the driver of the program. But the driver of the program will be where the dollar came from in the first place. So I think that's one lesson <laughs> that we have to learn and learn very fast. We have to have partners, which we have, but for us to drive this agenda, we must have the courage to say, we would like you to help us achieve this agenda, but we will do it anyway, with or you without your help, but we'd like your help. Because if somebody knows that this train is never going to move until they are on it, why would they run to the train? Because the train will never move until they are in it. But if you know that the train will move, it may move slower if you are not in it, because maybe you bring additional fuel to it, but it will move nevertheless. For me, that's one of the biggest lessons that we are slow to learn. I think we are getting there, but very slowly. But also, I think we are not learning that we, like any people in the world, have survived through ages because they had solutions to problems that they were meeting whether against lions or whatever, they had solutions. So sometimes we, we don't assert that yes, we want to learn from the rest of the world, but we also have solutions that we can offer to solve our problems. I, I will give you an example. <clears throat> After the genocide in Rwanda, there needed to be reconciliation, nation building, but also justice. And the Rwandans calculated that if they were to try the cases in the conventional way that everybody was expect them, expecting them to do, it will take them more than 100 years to finish those cases. So they then resorted to their own knowledge system, to their own way of dealing with issues like this. And a lot of us said, oh no, this is, there's not going to be justice, this, this gachacha, program is, is, is not good and so on. But they taught us that you 
you, 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 you stick by your decision because you are the one who's going to leave the consequences. And they wanted a, fa a fast resolution of these cases so that they can go forward and, build and rebuild their nation and, and, and have reconciliation. And they went ahead. And I'm, I'm glad that now all of us are quiet because it has worked. Nothing is perfect in this world, not the conventional system, not any system, but it worked. I'm just using that as, as an example that sometimes we have not learned that no people could have survived and not become extinct unless they had solutions through the ages. And sometimes we abandon all those solutions and expect that solutions will come from elsewhere. Maybe I should stop there. That was most useful, uh, Minister. Uh, I understand you have an appointment with government of Cote d'Ivoire in, in, in a few minutes, um, and you'll have to leave us uh, at uh, 45, a quarter to. What I'd like to do is, before you leave, if you will, yeah. is to provide uh, the audience, I think, uh, with an opportunity uh, to make some comments, raise some questions uh, to you before you leave. I think that would be very, very useful. I haven't seen any two-hand interventions, but please, this is the right time to be asking the questions. N'hésitez pas à poser des questions en français. Nous sommes une institution bilingue, même si nous avons parlé pour l'instant presque exclusivement euh, en anglais. Euh, donc, je vais prendre trois questions ou trois commentaires. Je vous demanderai trois, deux choses, de vous introduire brièvement et, et, et de s'en tenir à une présentation, une question euh, la plus courte possible. Et une seule question par personne. Donc, je vois le monsieur, the gentleman in the middle. Do we have some microphones? Or if you want to start? Oh, yes, we have microphones. Good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Roger Bassandine. I'm the chair person of the uh, African Parliamentarians Network on Development Evaluation. Allow me to raise my question in French. Uh, Votre Excellence, Madame uh, Zuma, vous avez tout à l'heure déclaré pendant votre uh, propos introductif, que l'évaluation fait parfois peur. Et je voudrais donc savoir si, pendant votre passage à la tête de la Commission de l'Union africaine, vous avez l'impression que nous avons appris. Est-ce que les États ont progressé dans l'acceptation de l'évaluation dans l'acceptation que ils peuvent apprendre de leurs propres erreurs sans que l'évaluation soit conçue, soit comprise comme un instrument de peut-être du parti d'opposition, des partis d'opposition. Parce que comme parlementaires, nous sommes véritablement confrontés à la difficulté d'amener les gouvernements à accepter que l'évaluation surtout parlementaire, peut aider à élaborer de meilleures politiques. Merci. Merci beaucoup, monsieur, pour cette excellente question. Alors, je vais prendre trois questions. Je vois la dame à gauche, s'il vous plaît, et ensuite à monsieur au fond. Bonjour, bonjour on, à tous. Je remercie prendre... euh, son excellence, madame la ministre, d'être avec nous aujourd'hui et de nous donner la chance d'apprendre d'elle et de nos honorables invités. Euh, je rejoins un peu euh, la première intervention dans le sens qu'on euh, est motivé à apprendre, apprendre beaucoup plus de l'avenir que euh, de notre passé. Notre passé, pour euh, pouvoir euh, en apprendre, il faut l'évaluer. Et euh, pour l'évaluer, il faut euh, un œil critique et beaucoup d'indépendance. Et là, je pose la question à Madame la Ministre pour euh, savoir si, dans son, son parcours euh, euh, aussi riche et varié, est-ce qu'elle peut juger que euh, tous les mécanismes et les, euh, les garanties euh, ont, euh, ont été... Euh, 
ont été disponibles pour assurer une évaluation indépendante et euh, transparente. Et donc, j'ai oublié de me présenter. Je m'appelle Aziza Chergui. Je suis membre du conseil d'administration en tant que conseiller supérieur auprès de l'administrateur pour le Maroc, la Tunisie et le Togo. Merci. Merci, merci à vous. Je vais prendre une dernière question parce que nous n'avons pas le temps d'en prendre plus. Mais n'hésitez pas, on aura d'autres occasions d'interroger les panélistes. Donc je vous en prie, notez bien votre question. Vous aurez l'occasion de, de, de le poser tout à l'heure. Peut-être pas à son excellence, mais à d'autres panélistes. Le, le monsieur au fond, c'est Ok, je vous remercie. Je salue la présence de Mme Zouma Abidjan. Je suis Adi Arsène, membre du réseau ivoirien de suivi et évaluation. J'ai des préoccupations. Juste savoir, madame, vous étiez commissaire de l'Union africaine, vous avez lancé le passeport africain. Jusqu'à présent, ce passeport, je ne l'ai pas encore dans ma poche. Je voudrais savoir si les chefs d'État n'ont pas adhéré à ce projet, qu'est-ce qui freine ce projet. Et ma deuxième préoccupation, vous étiez à la tête de la commission de l'Union africaine. Quelle est la tâche que vous avez confiée à la société civile et quels sont les résultats que ça a donné Je vous remercie. Merci, monsieur, pour la, la brièveté de votre question. Une seule question par personne, ça rendra la chose beaucoup plus, plus simple. Non, on, je, je vois qu'il y a beaucoup de mains qui se lèvent, c'est très bien. Euh, on aura l'occasion de, de, de poser des questions tout à l'heure. Je voudrais en profiter. On a à peu près... We've got about seven minutes in front of you before 45, Your Excellency. Um, we, we'd love you to, to stay as long as you feel you can. Um, in the meantime, I think we've heard some very good questions uh, uh, from the audience and... Um, And it's over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the first question, I think any ruling party that does not um, take into account what parliamentarians say, because they have a responsibility of oversight, <laughs> they look at what's going on in the country, um, Is, is, is not taking advantage of a resource that is there for them. I'll just give you an example. When, when I was appointed Minister of Home Affairs, Home Affairs were, had a problem to the extent that the, the citizens called it horror affairs. And I was asked to go and see if we can turn it back to Home Affairs. So one of the resources I used was precisely the parliamentarians to say as they move around in their constituencies, they must inform me and inform the department whatever they see is wrong so that we can all uh, gather this information as quickly as possible using all the resources. The citizens themselves were able to, to, to give us information But parliamentarians were very critical in assisting us through their own oversight, not by praising, but by saying there's a problem here and for us to resolve it. I'm just saying from our point of view, it's very important to listen to the opposition, to listen to the parliamentarians. But of course, parliamentarians must also ensure that they do not go and say things, because some parliamentarians will say things that are not possible to do because they know they don't have the responsibility to do them. And therefore, a, a ruling party cannot say just because it's said by a parliamentarian it's possible. So if we all work towards the same goal, but occupying different spaces, I think we can always work together and we should work together. That would be my answer. The question about whether the, uh, when I was at the AU, the mechanisms were all in place for evaluation. I, I wouldn't say they were all in place. If you heard what I said, I also said that There is work that needed to be completed by the statisticians, especially uh, to tying the knots of these um, uh, mechanisms. So there is still some work to do. But 
I also believe that you can never say I have everything in place because as you implement and evaluate, you'll find that there are things that you need to tweak, there are things that you need to change. So it's an ongoing, but uh, most of the things were in place, but not all, to be honest. Uh, and then the passport. The, the AU distributed the passports to the, to the governments. Even the, I think the president of ADP uses the African passport. But what we said as the AU, we do not know the citizens. So we can't be charged with distributing the passport to the citizens. So we, we decentralized the rolling out to the citizens, to each country. You, you are in ECOWAS, Eco, as you know, the ECOWAS passport is not distributed by ECOWAS. It's distributed by member states. And it's an ECOWAS passport, but it says which country has distributed it. And so the, the same thing was agreed on the African passport. So Cote d'Ivoire will have to roll out the African passport to its citizens. South Africa will have to do the same and so on. So that's where it is. But those that the, the AU could give, it did give. All the heads of state have the African passport, the ambassadors, the institutions, but starting to now give to individual citizens was decentralized to countries. I hope that um, answers your, your question. And I think you should ask your foreign minister where this process is and the minister of interior or whether they intend rolling it out when, but that function has been decentralized. And then the role played by civil society. I think even from the beginning I said that the first draft of Agenda 2063 came from civil society, different sectors of civil society, because civil society is not a, a monolithic, but we invited different sectors, and even now, uh, civil society has to play a role in implementing and probably also evaluating the um, Agenda 2063. So I think civil society is a, a very important aspect of uh, monitoring, of evaluation, and of also giving views about what can be done better because there's nobody who has the monopoly of views. It's not government people, it's not uh, institutions. Everyone has views and you can learn from every single person. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, it's now 11.45. We do hope you can stay with us as long as possible. You're most welcome to do so. If, however, you feel you need to leave now, uh, then... I'm sorry, just to explain, pre the president of the country has asked to see me at 12, and it's the only slot he has. So I think I'm, I have an obligation to honor that. I'll come back, but maybe it will be in time for lunch. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I suggest we now resume sort of the questions to our panelists, and I'll be turning to you, uh, uh, per Basto, for your senses, are we learning? And I think, uh, uh, in, in particular, I think what I took out of Caroline's presentation, there are two things that matter, not only, but one is getting the right mindset, being in a position to learn from past failure, and then uh, uh, having the right institutions, which is a point that uh, uh, the minister also made. Uh, uh, so, so, so Per, what is your sense? Uh, are we learning? And what is getting in the way if we're not? Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, yes, I think we are learning, but uh, as you already said in your uh, introduction, we are not learning well enough. Um, and to me, that's, um, that's kind of a paradox, because we have, um, we have all the knowledge, we have the research, we have the wisdom about what it takes to learn. Um, 
and still we're not learning. Uh, what I see, I spent most, most of my life in public uh, organizations, in, in the national government, in international organizations. And I see a tendency that I'm a bit um, uh, worrisome. I see uh, young people coming in to the, these organizations um, with the right skills, uh, with uh, 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 the, uh, the um, commitment to make a difference, and, and often, uh, uh, you know, wanting to, to, to learn and to improve things. But as they ra rise in the hierarchies, they seem to forget uh, why they're there. Uh, our organizations are, you know, the, the bureaucratic nature of what we're doing seems to be um, uh, preventing us from learning. And I wonder why. Why are we suddenly afraid of talking about mistakes? Why are we afraid of sharing knowledge? Why do we suddenly have a short-term perspective and not sufficiently, not necessarily the 50-year 50, uh, 50 perspective, but at least more than the next budget cycle. Uh, so why is this happening? To me, um, uh, culture, as already mentioned by Caroline, is important. Uh, what are the norms um, in the organizations um, we are living? Um, but leadership is so essential. Uh, and leadership um, needs to have the vision, like the minister, talked about, but leadership also needs to be role models uh, to, to engage in discussions about, uh, well, to allow mistakes to happen, but to, to, uh, not repeatedly the same mistakes, but at least to learn from them. Um, and we need, of course, uh, capacity uh, among ourselves. Uh, we need to, um, and we need to use the right type of knowledge. Uh, and I think that's increasingly uh, uh, a difficulty. What is credible knowledge uh, today? Um, uh, often we have uh, this short-term perspective, so we go into Google, and then we, uh, the, uh, the first hits, we think that's the knowledge. Um, we need to, to, to be more critical about what is credible knowledge. And here, uh, of course, we as evaluators, and you mentioned that, um, that my network is uh, in charge of, of the evaluation standards. But we have many uh, networks. We have the AFREA, we have the National Evaluation Network, and, and together we are, we are coming up with, with the standards for good uh, evaluation that creates credible knowledge. And just to mention that also, uh, we are now having a consultation around the DAC standards for, for, for evaluation, so please engage in that, uh, all of you. But, but we have the knowledge about what is good knowledge, so let's use it. And then uh, the last point also mentioned by the minister that I find extremely important is to share the knowledge. In our bureaucratic organizations, knowledge is often seen as power. So let's protect our knowledge to, to have the power to, um, uh, in our positions. But let's rather share the knowledge and share our um, insights. So I think that's um, something we need to improve. Great. Thanks, thanks very much, Per. Uh, Hannan, turning to you, uh, I think one of the interesting things that Per just told us, he said, uh, you know, the longer you stay in an organization, the older you get, the less appetite you have for learning. So uh, I was wondering where you feel you fit in that sort of negative learning curve. How much appetite is left uh, uh, with you in terms of learning? And, and just more generally, the, the question, do you feel that the African Development Bank, for example, is learning, uh, learning from failure, learning from its achievements? And... What do, you, what do you feel you can do to, to help that? Um, so just, uh, just to say that uh, I've been here for six months, so <laughs> I'm on the learning curve. Um, but I've been before at the IMF for 10 years, at the uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development for six years. Uh, so I've seen different institutions. Uh, and definitely, like, you know, the, the trademark of a successful institution is learning from mistakes. 
is really and having the humility to say where you went wrong, why did it happen, and how can you improve going forward? And you, you can see this in all of them, like, you know, I think have realized that. Um, at the African Development Bank, part of uh, my department is in charge of what we call ADUA, which is Additionality and Development Outcome Assessment of private sector projects. And this in itself is an evaluation tool that was introduced to make sure that we um, improve the um, uh, kind of the targeting of the projects that we do, uh, that uh, the projects that we are doing are uh, aligned with the strategic priorities of the bank, with the needs of the countries, uh, as well as um, uh, achieve a credible development outcome, estimated development outcome, so it's ex-ante assessment. Um, and it's a way also for keeping accountability, for, for the board to keep accountability of what we're doing, how we're doing it. Uh, but it also has helped in uh, the way that um, it, it, be, it helps with entry, uh, quality at entry. So it's not just that um, the policing role, which tends to be very difficult with, I think, in, in general, uh, when you talk about evaluation, there is always that fear that you're there to judge, just like, you know, good, bad, uh, you know, pass, fail. Uh, but it's, it's the role of really becoming more of a partner uh, and helping in the design and improving the project, which is like the advisory role. And it's the same thing for countries. I think part of the fear across the continent when you say evaluation units is like, you know, they are looking for what you've done wrong. Uh, I think a really, you know, kind of more constructive way to go about it is to think about it, how can they help these, you know, different ministries, policy makers, to make uh, uh, the projects or the initiatives that are being done more successful. And then, like, you know, it's more of a journey together and actually helping you improve rather than just having this a bit of a suspicious relationship. So that's a very important um, um, aspect of uh, um, uh, doing, like, you know, this, uh, uh, such evaluations. Um, we, you know, it, as, uh, as this tool, the ADUA tool, has been also um, kind of a learning curve. We've been learning by doing. We've been uh, revising the me methodology, looking at issues where we have, you know, uh, maybe better ways to capture. Uh, so there is always continuous uh, uh, learning process. It, it's, uh, um, it's really adaptive. Um, but I'd like to just like also talk about for the continent overall, because I think we have learned overall for the continent across countries. And I think to me, the, the, the evidence shows in uh, how the macroeconomic policy over the last 20 years have improved. You know, we've moved along the you know, development stage, we have improved in terms of income and macroeconomic stabilization relative to 20 years ago. So this has happened. So this only happened because we really learned from, you know, the history. Uh, but uh, the question is, ha did it uh, happen fast enough? Could it have been faster? And the answer is yes. And part of it is uh, what was mentioned before about the institutions. The focus more on the role of the institutions rather than individuals uh, or like reform champions only. Uh, uh, but also uh, uh, there is uh, the issue of communication. And I think we, in general, in the continent, we don't communicate enough uh, on what we're doing, like, you know, success stories, uh, things that are being achieved so that the normal average citizen can feel it. Uh, and uh, uh, also, uh, even about our failure, like what we've learned from our, our failures, because this creates the, that culture of understanding that it's not uh, um, uh, like, you know, it, sometimes there is this perception that just it's much easier as a policymaker, especially in the continent, to keep status quo. Your, your job will be more secure. You may not do much, but it's much easier than to actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, take the chance of really pushing for a reform that may fail or may not. So showing even when things fail, what, why, did, why did they fail and how you're learning and adapting 
can actually increase the trust between the citizens and the governments. So I think it's a very important um, issue to, to really take forward, uh, um, like, uh, you know, in, in thinking about these issues of learning uh, from the past in the, in the continent. Um, so uh, these are my thoughts overall. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hannan. Uh, on va peut-être changer de langue. Ça fait longtemps que nous parlons en anglais. Je, je vais passer maintenant bientôt la parole uh, uh, au vice-président Pierre, uh, Pierre Guislain. Uh, et après son intervention, uh, je voudrais de nouveau ouvrir, uh, uh, donner, vous donner l'opportunité de poser des questions à nos panélistes avant de passer à un prochain round de questions où uh, on prendra un angle un petit peu différent, peut-être en rebondissant sur quelques éléments que vient de, de citer uh, Hanan. Donc, uh, je crois, Pierre, ce qu'a ce que, ce qu dit de particulièrement intéressant uh, Hanan, c'est le besoin ou l'importance de remettre en cause le statu quo. Alors, ça ne fait pas très longtemps que vous êtes à la Banque africaine, un peu plus que six mois, peut-être, je crois, presque deux ans autour de ça. Et donc, euh, est-ce que vous pouvez partager avec nous euh, votre expérience, euh, non seulement à la Banque africaine, mais de votre longue expérience professionnelle à la, à, également à la Banque mondiale euh, Merci, Simon. C'est avec plaisir. Donc, euh, je commencerai peut-être par un exemple de mon premier boulot il y a plus de trois... Enfin, non, pas plus, il y a trois... Un peu plus plus de 30 ans à la Banque mondiale. Alors, un des premiers jobs qu'on m'a demandé de faire, c'est de faire un rapport d'achèvement d'un projet. Je travaillais sur le Sénégal à l'époque, c'était un rapport d'achèvement d'un projet que d'autres avaient fait, je venais d'arriver. Et j'ai appris énormément en faisant ça. Je crois qu'une des choses qu'on ne fait pas suffisamment, c'est demander au staff, aux collègues, aux équipes, d'apprendre par eux-mêmes, d'investir de, de, du temps avant d'entamer une opération, avant d'engager des consultants, de faire leur propre travail d'évaluation de qu ce qui a été fait dans ce domaine, qu'est-ce qui a marché, qu'est-ce qui n'a pas marché. On a tendance à aller trop vite vers l'action, vers les recommandations, vers la définition d'objectifs, sans avoir suffisamment fait l'effort un peu d'introspection, d'analyse, d'évaluation qui devrait être à la base de presque toutes les activités, de, de, de tous les projets, etc. Donc je crois qu'il y a, il y a un, un, un déficit de mode de fonctionnement dans beaucoup d'institutions, et celle, dont celle-ci est ma précédente également, où on n'investit pas assez au niveau, au niveau de, du travail des équipes, on n'investit pas assez en amont au niveau euh, tirer les leçons, essayer de confronter les points de vue. Le, le, la meilleure façon d'apprendre, c'est le dialogue. C'est pas... Euh, je crois qu'on a tendance à formaliser l'évaluation. Je fais quelque chose et vous m'évaluez. Alors que... c'est important. Nous avons besoin de, ce, de cet aspect formel. Mais tout aussi important est le dialogue, le débat. Je prépare un projet, je discute avec les collègues, j'ai un débat sur les approches. On a très peu de débats sur les approches. On, a, on vous propose l'approche A, et parfois il y a quelqu'un qui dit « oui, mais pourquoi pas l'approche B ?» On a peu de discussions en amont sur pourquoi l'approche A et pas l'approche B. Que, où est-ce que ça a marché Pourquoi est-ce que vous pensez que ça a marché dans tel contexte Donc ça, c'est... Pour moi, je, vois, je suis un, un opérationnel, hein, je ne suis pas un évaluateur. Mais donc, pour moi, on n'utilise pas suffisamment l'évaluation, l'apprentissage dans notre travail quotidien. On a tendance à externaliser l'évaluation et l'apprentissage. Nous, on fait notre boulot et puis d'autres, mes voisins ici, nous évaluent. Et ça, il y a quelque part, il y a, il y a un déficit. Euh, un autre point qui me paraît important, c'est que l'apprentissage, la façon dont on apprend, est quelque chose de très culturel. Moi, j'apprends différemment de la façon dont toi, tu apprends, par exemple. Euh, et la Banque mondiale apprend différemment que la Banque africaine. Et la Banque africaine apprend différemment euh, que le gouvernement de Côte d'Ivoire ou qu'une euh, que, qu qu banque privée euh, en Afrique du Sud, par exemple. Donc, comment apprenons-nous Et je crois qu'on... On ne, passe, on ne passe pas suffisamment de temps à, voir, à réfléchir à la façon dont une institution apprend elle-même. Comment apprenons-nous à la Banque africaine de développement Et ça, pour moi, je crois qu'il faut, faut se poser cette question. Et on a tendance à, à créer toute une série d'organismes externes qui vont évaluer, analyser, surveiller, critiquer euh, ce, ce qu'on fait. Et on ne passe pas assez de temps à voir... 
quel est, quels sont les inputs qu'on reçoit qui sont absorbés par l'organisation et qui se reflètent dans des changements de comportement et, et, de, euh, et, et de façon de travailler. Donc pour moi, euh, cet aspect culturel est absolument essentiel. Comment apprenons-nous, Banque africaine de développement, comment apprenons-nous de nos collègues, comment apprenons-nous euh, de l'écosystème dans lequel euh, euh, nous travaillons Et euh, si j'avais... Une, une, euh, un aspect qui me paraît vraiment important, c'est trouver une manière de dialoguer, de débattre, d'avoir des brainstorming, je ne sais pas comment on dit en français, euh, qui ne soient pas formels et institutionnels, mais qui soient vraiment une ouverture au savoir, à la connaissance, à l'expérience des collègues, que ce soit leur expérience dans leur poste, leur mandat, leur fonction actuelle, ou leur expérience humaine et, et professionnelle de manière plus large. Alors, je vais passer la parole tout de suite à, à, à l'audience, mais avant, je voudrais vous, vous interroger sur une question, je crois, très importante que vous venez de soulever, Pierre. Vous avez dit deux choses, je crois, que je retiens. La première, c'est l'importance de l'apprentissage dans une organisation, et comme l'a dit Caroline tout à l'heure, et, et d'autres, dans sa vie aussi, il faut avoir le, le bon état d'esprit pour pouvoir apprendre de ses échecs. Donc, l'importance de l'apprentissage, mais également la difficulté de l'apprentissage et la difficulté de l'apprentissage dans une institution comme la Banque africaine. Est-ce que vous avez le sentiment, Pierre, que les opérationnels ont le temps, ont l'espace pour pouvoir se consacrer à une réflexion qui permettrait, par exemple, de tirer les, leçons d un, d un, d un, les bonnes leçons, comme vous l'avez fait au début de votre carrière euh, sur le PCA Est-ce que les conditions sont là Et ensuite, je passerai la parole pour des questions, euh, élargir un petit peu le débat. Donc, euh, je ne vous surprendrai pas en disant que les pressions sont avant tout pour délivrer des projets et atteindre nos objectifs de prêt en matière de volume. Ça, c'est la pression. C'est ici, c'est à la Banque mondiale, à AFC, où je travaillais avant. Ce sont des pressions similaires. Et donc, il, il n'y a pas une pression forte au niveau de l'apprentissage. Ça, pour moi, c'est très, très clair. Ce, ce, qui, ce, qui, euh, est très, euh, ce qui me frappe ici... Donc, euh, à la Banque africaine de développement, qui est encore plus fort qu'à la Banque mondiale, qui elle-même l'avait plus fortement qu'AFC, c'est le cloisonnement institutionnel, où chacun a un rôle et remplit ce rôle, et, mais il n'y a pas assez de, de collectivité dans, dans, dans les démarches. Donc chacun fait son boulot. Et mon boulot, c'est de préparer un projet. On m'a donné des, 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 des KPIs, donc des, des indicateurs que mon projet, je dois le faire maximum en six mois de la date euh, de, où je fais ma date de concept à la date où je vais au conseil d'administration. Il y a beaucoup d'étapes à franchir. J'ai des clients à qui je dois... Donc, certains de nos KPIs nous empêche quelque part d'apprendre. Je crois qu'il faut, il faut être un peu critique et voir si, dans la façon dont on fonctionne, dans le, le cloisonnement institutionnel qui, qui caractérise d'une certaine manière le, le fonctionnement quotidien de la banque, et les KPI qu'on se donne, est-ce qu'on n'a pas un mécanisme qui, euh, en soi, limite les possibilités d'apprentissage Ceci dit, chacun a... C'est ça... Le, dans ce genre d'organisation, on a la capacité de dire non, ce projet requiert trois mois de plus, je dois consulter les bénéficiaires, je dois parler aux clients, je dois engager d'autres partenaires qui ont fait des projets similaires, et je ne serai pas, ce projet ne sera pas évalué dans les six mois normaux. Donc ça, ça demande quelque part un courage personnel, pour aller à l'encontre de normes institutionnelles qui ont, qui ont leur justification. Je ne dis pas qu'elles n'ont pas leur justification. Merci. Yeah. Caroline, Pearl, I see you are nodding at many of the things that uh, Pierre just said, and uh, I think there's some very useful lessons that can be learned for the institution. And I'll be coming back to you on, on some of these points, for maybe for a quick reaction before we move to the next question. But before that, let me turn to the audience. I know there are lots of questions. Uh, let me take them in the order I've seen them. Je vais prendre ce monsieur-là, je n'ai pas pris la, la rangée du milieu pour l'instant, donc euh, une question ici, et ensuite je vois trois, trois mains levées dans la rangée euh, de gauche. Donc, euh, s'il vous plaît, donc, le principe c'est, euh, présentez-vous, une question et une seule, 
et essayer de la faire la plus brève et la plus claire possible pour que tout le monde ait le temps de prendre la parole et poser la question, et surtout d'avoir la réponse. Très bien. Merci beaucoup. Je suis M. Logo Destin, chef de service gouvernance au port autonome d'Abidjan. Je voudrais intervenir par rapport à, enfin, sur un des points soulevés par M. Pierre Jusselin euh, concernant la séparation des tâches. Et effectivement, nous avons les évaluateurs et les opérateurs. Et donc, on respecte le principe de la séparation des tâches pour que l'évaluateur puisse poser un regard neutre et objectif sur ce qui est fait. Et bien évidemment, j'intègre ce que M. Pierre vient de dire, à savoir intégrer les débats sur les approches. Et pour pouvoir permettre les débats sur les approches et retenir la bonne approche, il faut tout simplement mettre en place ce que nous appelons une base de données des connaissances ou des bonnes pratiques. Donc, nous avons l'évaluation qui finit par faire des recommandations et mettre en place une, bonne, une base de données des connaissances. Et bien, lors des débats sur les approches, on s'appuie sur la base de données des connaissances. Donc, voici un peu ma contribution. Très bien. Donc, c'était un commentaire plutôt qu'une question, si j'ai bien, si bien retenu. Donc, trois, j'ai vu trois mains levées à gauche, s'il vous plaît. Bonjour, messieurs et mesdames. Merci de me donner l'opportunité de poser la question. Bon, moi, ma question elle est très simple. Je voulais savoir quelle politique la BAD met en place en vue de la formation des jeunes sur les questions d'évaluation. Pourquoi je pose cette question euh, Pour mon cas, j'aime le suivi évaluation. J'ai oublié de me présenter, je suis M. Traoré Ibrahim du réseau Ivoirien de suivi évaluation. Cette année, par exemple, j'ai bénéficié d'une bourse entière au niveau du programme international de formation en évaluation du développement. La bourse faisait environ 7000 dollars canadiens. Bon, il euh, n'y a pas de politique mise en place, donc je n'ai pas pu participer à cette formation, alors que j'aime l'évaluation. Je pouvais participer à cette formation et puis euh, ça allait être en tout cas un bon atout pour notre pays. Mais malheureusement, je n'ai pas pu participer, j'ai perdu la bourse. Voilà pourquoi je pose la question. Merci. Bien noté, c'est encore un commentaire, je pense, plutôt qu'une question. Euh, je... Pardon, alors il y a beaucoup de mains qui se lèvent, je vais en prendre deux autres et ensuite on va, on, on va essayer de faire tourner un petit peu la parole. Euh... Pardon, je vais prendre à droite, oui, je n'ai pas pris de questions à droite, même deux questions à droite. Je reviendrai vers la gauche. Vous aurez l'occasion, ne vous inquiétez pas, gardez vos questions, vous aurez l'occasion de les poser un peu plus tard. Donc, présentez-vous et s'il vous plaît, une question ou un commentaire, et ici ça va être bref. Je suis Mademoiselle Konena Ranitiensi étudiante doctorante en anthropologie sociale, option de développement. Je travaille sur le partenariat public-privé. Ma question est la suivante. Selon vous, le monsieur, le monsieur qui vient de faire son exposé, donner son parcours sur l'évaluation, étant donné qu'il a travaillé à la Banque mondiale et maintenant il est à la BAD, selon lui, quels sont les critères d'une bonne évaluation c'est une question que je propose de garder pour un peu plus tard parce que c'est une question que j'ai posée à nos panélistes et je voudrais qu'ils... Donc si vous, si vous voulez bien, okay. on va la garder, on, on leur posera tout à l'heure parce okay. que je vais poser la même question. Merci. D'autres questions Pardon, Madame, excusez-moi. Bonjour, je suis docteur Aka Kamarawa, je suis sous-directrice de l'évaluation de l'action sanitaire au ministère de la Santé et de l'hygiène publique Côte d'Ivoire. Alors ma question c'est de savoir... Euh, pourquoi on a encore du mal à avoir des financements en ce qui concerne l'évaluation, le suivi, l'évaluation On constate que même avec les partenaires, ce volet a quand même... Euh... Donc j'aimerais bien savoir ce que le panel en pense. Merci. D'accord, c'est une bonne question. Et, et comme nous avons deux évaluateurs sur le panel, je crois que c'est une... Nous attendons des réponses de, de, de leur part. Mais ce n'est pas, pas entièrement dans leur main, je dois le dire. Euh, une question de ce monsieur Suite, on va repasser la parole aux panélistes. Ne vous inquiétez pas, non, je reviendrai vers vous. Je reviendrai vers vous. Um, good morning. My name is Michele Tarsila. I'm the regional evaluation advisor for UNICEF in Western Central Africa. I've been talking about learning from failures for many years. And at some point, about a few years ago, I tried to give a workshop on this very subject with Michael Bamberger at IBDET. And only two people signed up. And so we needed to cancel the, the course just to give an idea about how receptive the public could be. So I have this dilemma now in my profession, now especially that I cover 24 countries. Uh, it's really hard to promote learning from failures when those failures are going to be so blatantly discussed in an evaluation report. So for now, I am following more of a gradual approach. So I'm trying to learn and you know, discuss about failures internally, but I still have this ethical dilemma. This truth and the outcomes of these discussions should actually come out as well in those reports. 
but that will impact funding for my organization as well as many other organizations. So in your own experience, since you've been talking so convincingly about learning for failures, what have you done to make them transition from internal discussion about failures to external uh, externalization of those failures to other audiences, possibly in a successful manner? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop here, but we'll come back for more questions. So please, uh, please keep them. Note your questions. You'll have an opportunity to come back and ask them. Um, I want to turn to 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 you, uh, Caroline and, and Per. There were many questions around the importance of evaluation, the need to resource um, evaluations, and um, uh, we all, I think, appreciate and understand that um, learning is one of the key objectives of any evaluation exercise. And uh, I also understand that uh, both of you in, in different capacities are quite keen to revisit, to rethink some of the criteria that guide evaluation. So the question that I'd like to ask both of you, and I'll be providing an opportunity to Pierre and to Hannan if they want to chip in uh, later on, is uh, are we asking the right questions? And more importantly still, are we getting the right answers? Caroline, do you want to kick off? So firstly, I, I want to actually reinforce what many of the other panelists spoke about. And when I mention it as systems, institutional culture and all of that is, is for me part of this. Um, the, the enabling environment is absolutely quintessential of how effective evaluation can work, how much one can learn, whether it's learning from failure, learning from evaluation, or learning from any experience. Um, we did an evaluation of a learning in World Bank lending just a couple of years ago, and some of the feedback was really uh, very much what actually Pierre was talking about here in terms of not having the time to sit down with colleagues to talk about what was this experience elsewhere and, and how to sort of really draw on that experience and make more of it. Um, quite often also uh, the questions that are being asked in committees that review projects, uh, I think it's called OPSCOM here, um, are more about, you know, ticking certain institutional boxes. Have we followed this process? Have we met this requirement, et cetera, et cetera? And they don't ask the question, is this really the best way of how we can do this? Is this, um, have we tried this before? Should we really do this again or should we do something different? And, and uh, Pierre, what you were saying in terms of having the dialogue early on about, should this project look like this or this or this, you know? That is supposedly happening. It's supposed to happen. Projects are not supposed to go immediately to this is the solution. But in all the 30 years of development experience I've had, I have not seen one project that started out with, let's debate what will be the best solution. So this is a very fundamental problem to why then learning becomes so difficult, right? Um, in terms of um, a, you know, resourcing evaluation and are we asking the, the, the right question, um, my own experience has been that we can actually ask very important and informative evaluation questions that correspond to what uh, stakeholders want to know. Um, now, there is one um, group of evaluators that strict very, uh, stick very strictly to the criteria. And they ask the question, was the project relevant? Was it effective? Was it efficient? Did it have an impact? And is that sustainable? And it makes it very easy for the evaluator. This is sort of like a, a checklist on our side. But um, there is nothing in the DAC criteria that prescribes that that is how it should happen. Um, and I've pushed my teams to asking uh, other questions that are more informative while still applying then the criteria because you can still use the criteria um, to, to assess what, what comes out of it. Um, but I also want to speak a little bit more about learning from failure and Michele, thank you for throwing that line. This was not pre-discussed even though it's almost uh, as useful for me. So one part of my career uh, 
Maria, I was with the World Food Program. Uh, it's an institution that is 100% donor f donated, I mean, funded by donation. There is no paid-in capital that's secure. Every single year they have to go out and raise funds. There is no money that uh, is in the bank and that they know they will have. And when I arrived there, there was a great resistance. It was very much what you said. Bad news will mean we won't get any money. Um, through a very um, uh, uh, long process of lots of conversations and demonstration of how evaluation can help them do better, um, I got them to actually uh, embrace evaluation. And my line of argument that was sort of like woven through all of the conversations was, everybody knows that what we do is difficult. If you pretend you can succeed without making mistakes, nobody will believe you. You lose your own credibility. And uh, I think that really hit home with WFP. Um, and then we also improved the quality of our evaluations in order to supply them things that were useful. Um, time them that they fed into the, the conversation. So there are many things, it's, to me it's not a one-way street. It's not the evaluators to blame or the people in the operations to blame. We have to work together. We all have to try to do better um, and we have to have conversations of how we can make that work together. Thanks. Um, um, I think one of the important um, points that you just made, Caroline, that uh, I'd like us to consider and think about is uh, making sure we have the space and environment for failure, reasonable failure, from which we can learn. Uh, now, now, Per, uh, coming back to, to the question, you're basically the custodian of the uh, evaluator's criteria, and we had a brief presentation uh, from Caroline about the five criteria, and I know that you had a discussion yesterday afternoon around them, and, uh, and more recent, I mean, uh, we also had a conversation along those lines in, in Manila. So, so are, we, are, are we asking the right questions? Do we have the right criteria? And are we getting the right answers to them? Uh, you know, um, <coughs> criteria, standards, uh, all these things are tools to be used in a certain context. <coughs> and uh, the, we cannot automatically apply them everywhere. We need to understand the context we're working within. And, and I think what Pierre said, um, the dialogue with the stakeholders uh, is essential to understand that. Uh, and that's often difficult for us as evaluators, you know, to, to do in a, in a sufficient way. Often we have a dialogue around uh, developing an evaluation program, uh, but then it difficult to have the ongoing dialogue as we develop the evaluation project. I think that's key. But that depends on people like Pierre to find time to do it. Um, you know, not only to send his uh, junior staff to meetings uh, 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 on a certain project, but, but to be engaged himself. Um, um, so, so that's important. Who are we dialoguing with? Are we dialoguing with the people that are in charge of, of um, the program, the policy, the strategy, that have you know, the vision uh, that they want to accomplish? Or are we, uh, are we talking with, 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 uh, with the wrong people? So I think often we end up asking the, the wrong questions. Yes, I, I, I think that's... Um, that's, um, um, uh, I think you're right about that. But uh, context understanding, you know, um, th there has been a debate uh, among evaluators. Uh, uh, what kind of role do you take? Are you an external observer of what is happening and not having an inter uh, any interference with uh, what's going on? You know, we talk about uh, uh, independence. But let's not talk about separation. Uh, we need to be embedded uh, in the organizations where we do our e evaluations and to understand um, not only the culture, the learning culture, but also uh, <coughs> the strategy, the policy, uh, what is going on internally in the organization. And that requires uh, um, uh, 
something for the evaluators to get involved and, and for uh, vice presidents to get involved. Nice, uh, nice segue. Uh, Pierre, you, you were nodding and I saw Hannah was nodding. A quick reaction. This was really a, an evaluator's question and uh, in a few minutes I'm going to be changing tack of the conversation a little bit, talking about some of the important points that were made earlier on in the keynote speech about the relevance and importance of evidence-based policymaking. But before we go that, maybe if, uh, some reactions fr from you, Pierre, and from you, Hannah, on what you heard. There was a question that was directed uh, uh, to you, uh, Pierre, on what... Uh, uh, you've learned from the World Bank uh, and comparing to the African Development Bank. So maybe some quick reactions before we change tack, and then I'm gonna, we're going to listen to you and then open the floor again for another round of questions. Bien, merci. Je parlerai en français comme je suis le francophone de service euh, dans ce panel. <laughs> euh, donc, peut-être quelques points rapides. Plus, il y a eu plusieurs questions sur le financement d'évaluation. Euh, il faut bien comprendre que la Banque africaine de développement, c'est avant tout une banque, on prête et euh, on, il y a d'autres sources de financement pour ce genre d'activité euh, qui sont plus euh, comme les, les bailleurs de fonds bilatéraux, etc. Nous avons des activités euh, qui permettent d'appuyer l'évaluation. Nous encourageons fortement dans le cadre de nos projets, les projets que nous avons avec les gouvernements, avec le secteur privé, nous encourageons très fort d'avoir des composants d'évaluation à l'intérieur de ces projets, mais nous ne sommes pas une agence de financement de bourse, on en finance pour même certaines, mais ce n'est pas, pas notre rôle, il y a d'autres agences qui sont là pour ça. Second commentaire sur l'importance d'apprendre des échecs. Et je crois qu'il y a eu plusieurs questions, et je crois que quand la ministre était là à la, à la réponse du parlementaire, la, la, la difficulté de discuter des échecs, c'est quand on craint que ces échecs, si on les reconnaît, vont être utilisés contre vous. Donc, quelque part, il faut créer un environnement où on peut admettre ces échecs et que ce soit vu de manière positive dans le contexte d'un apprentissage, d'une organisation qui apprend, qui, apprend, qui grandit, qui, euh, qui, qui s'améliore, et pas que la, la reconnaissance, l'admission de l'échec devienne l'occasion pour qu'on vous tape dessus, pour qu'on vous, vous coupe les fonds, euh, ou qu'on ne vous réalise pas, hein, si on est parlementaire, ou, euh, ou, ou gouvernement. Donc je crois que créer cette culture où non seulement on peut admettre l'échec, mais l'environnement dans lequel on opère admet, accepte qu'on admette l'échec et accepte d'apprendre. Pour moi, ça, c'est quelque chose de, de très, très important euh, qui n'est pas facile à, à réaliser. Euh, différence entre la Banque mondiale et la Banque africaine, ce sont des institutions euh, assez similaires qui fonctionnent de, de manière assez similaire. Elles sont toutes les deux trop, un peu trop bureaucratiques et ont toutes les deux des défis au niveau de l'apprentissage continu, disons. Et donc, euh, euh, ici, ce que... Euh, ce, ce qui me paraît, euh, ce que j'aime beaucoup, c'est qu'il y a, et on voit par exemple l'énergie dans la salle, il y a une, une volonté de dialogue et d'apprendre qui est très très forte. Et le fait qu'on soit euh, plus près du client est quelque chose qui nous permet d'avoir ce dialogue plus facilement et opportunité qu'on devrait exploiter un peu plus qu'on le fait actuellement. Merci, Pierre. Uh, Hannan, uh, a few reactions uh, uh, on your side. Uh, Pierre was just pointing out that, you know, as the African Development Bank and being based in Abidjan means that we're much closer uh, to, to the client than possibly other organizations that might be based, I don't know, in Washington or London. Um, but uh, maybe a few reactions to the point that have just been discussed. And then I'm going to change tack. We're going to talk about something slightly different, coming back to a very important point that I think uh, the minister made in her keynote speech. Uh, I uh, agree with many of the points that are made, and especially with what um, Caroline highlighted before um, about, like you know, the discussions, for example, at the, like OPSCOM uh, type of committee, and um, we ask kind of the things that we are like our methodologies goes by, but we uh, tend to not just you know be open-minded enough maybe to ask, can we do this better? Is this a better way to achieve what we wanna what we wanna do? Um, and I think this is one of the things that you know us as an institution as well. I think I've seen it also in other institutions need to work more on having this kind of like more open-minded uh, uh, way of thinking and approaching things. Yes, we have a methodology which is very useful in anchoring us, but we also need to uh, be able to a bit think out of the box. 
Um, and uh, in general, in, in, in um, I, 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 there is, uh, as well as in governments, there is a, a tendency to just go with what you're accustomed to. Even sometimes, like you ask, but why we're not doing it this way? It's because this is how we do it. And it's a very easy answer because you're, you know, uh, you know the staff, the ministry, this is what they're used to. Uh, but we need to, you know, to have a way of breaking that, of just doing things maybe in, a, in ways that make more sense, that are more efficient, and just not because we're, this is how we're used to doing it is not good enough. Um, but also, I think, in, in, in the whole discussion we're talking about evaluation as a tool, it's really about boils down to optimally using very scarce resources. Scarce resources for us as um, uh, African Development Bank, but also scarce resources for the whole continent. Each country have, we have limited scarce resources to how we, we, we can use it as a tool to really help us in prioritizing uh, in how best to use that money. And if we can adopt it this way and communicate it both to policymakers and to the public as a way of really uh, you know, uh, getting the, the most out of the buck uh, will go a long way. Thank you. Yeah. I now suggest that we, we change a bit, uh, we shift the conversation a little bit, because um, one of the things that uh, Her Excellency mentioned uh, in her keynote speech struck me as being a, a very important point that was made, and I very much want to hear your reactions uh, on that. And she quoted Nelson Mandela, and in particular, the 1996 census that was organized in South Africa. And in essence, what uh, uh, Mandela said is this census is important because we need an accurate understanding of needs. Uh, that's what was said. So this brings me to the question about uh, evidence-based policymaking, the importance of evidence-based policymaking. Or is it as important as we think it might be? Now, when you talk to very serious policy wonks uh, uh, like yourselves, like all of us here, there seems to be a sense that, uh, uh, that they believe in the strength of, of evidence. Uh, on the other hand, I think when you turn and listen to public discourse, I think increasingly uh, in many countries uh, across the world, uh, uh, there are references to, for example, alternative facts or even alternative truths and maybe multiple truths, I, I, I don't know. So uh, from your perspective, and as evaluators, as policy makers, as decision makers, uh, what does the future of evidence-based policy making look like, or is it just a fanciful notion of the past? I think I'll start with you, Caroline, on this tricky question. I think I always get the tricky questions first. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I think when we, we talk about evidence-based policy making, we have to take a number of things into account. So, one is that there are political realities and political powers, and uh, they will always play a role. Um, when we submit evaluations, we submit evidence uh, and discuss that with the board, um, I do tell them that it's not expected that the evaluation is the sole aspect or criterion on which they make their decision about the next policy, because there are many other factors that play a role too. So some of those are extremely important and, and valuable and can help shape uh, things from a perspective of, for example, um, uh, people, uh, citizens who and their needs, uh, which the evaluation might not have addressed because the evaluation was looking back at a program and not looking at new needs. Um, but there are also s uh, serious risks that uh, the political powers can um, use the process to get their ways and, and, and uh, introduce policies that serve them. And we see that uh, around around the world. Um, as you pointed out, there is a very large risk around uh, data um, in, in the sense of there is now so much information out there and uh, much of it or, or 
when we are in social media, we don't necessarily fact check whether what we see and what gets the headline is actually evidence based or whether it's noise in the system. And, and that has really exponentially taken off and, and creates a lot of pressure on, on us evaluators. How do we raise the bar? How do we raise the voice and get attention, especially because our news are quite often not as spectacular as sensational and therefore don't grab the headlines. And so um, that is a very um, a big challenge. However, among our, us as evaluators, I see also the challenge that some of us are um, asking for more and more data. And it's, it's, it continues, we need to have more information and more information and more data. Um, and I personally don't believe that we will ever be in a situation where we can have 100% data to have 100% certainty to make a decision. And, and uh, we, we shouldn't, because that, that's, that's like a death sentence. You know, there is always going to be uncertainty and there has to be room for that. And sort of thinking about where are really the strategic uh, information gaps um, and how do we address them is, is for me, uh, critical. And in this respect, I'm really speaking about the um, impact evaluations, randomized control trials, uh, where um, uh, in the heydays it started with an article over 10 years ago, when will we ever learn? And it triggered this movement to have the RCTs um, ten years later, people started uh, to say, like, well, we're looking at them, they cost a lot of money, and they still don't answer our questions, right? So um, I, I would caution both sides, you know, the, the fake news side, but also us, how do we uh, do this uh, uh, better? Um, the other thing that has to do with policy policymaking um, is that uh, policymakers want very, very quick answers. So they love the things that can be presented very quickly. Uh, big data plays a, a big role in this, and, and I'm a believer that we should work together with big data and data scientists. Um, but uh, it, to rely entirely on um, uh, uh, quick data to uh, think that that is the answer it would be very short-sighted. Because uh, as any, any of us who work in evaluation knows, it does take uh, a lot of effort to digest uh, and triangulate not just data, but information from different sources, whether it's historic data that's documented or going out to stakeholders and um, getting feedback from them through various mechanisms. And it is really in the wisdom of pulling together and triangulating all of this that evaluations add new insights and, and, and helpful information for wise policy making. Unfortunately, many policymakers don't think they have the time for that, but we have been in a rush for the last 40 years, and we're not progressing. So I think slowing down to get further might be a good option to consider. Thanks, Caroline. And, and just to prove I don't ask, uh, you're not the only person I ask tricky questions, I'm going to put a tricky question to Perth straight away. You advise the Norwegian government, basically, uh, as an evaluator. Uh, so uh, I think Caroline was just saying, you know, pressure for time, uh, how, in what way is that consistent with uh, uh, sound, well thought out, evidence based advice and policy making? Um, and what is, what is the level of appetite uh, in Norway, say, for alternative facts? Um, just, let me just say that uh, I'm a sociologist. I, I, I believe there has always been different versions of the truth. It's not one, one version. So, so, um, but it, it is the way it's been communicated that has changed. Um, and let me just be extremely short. I, I think this, this, um, this gives us as evaluators a lot of challenges in how we communicate uh, um, the findings and recommendations. I mean, let me give credit to Aide for having uh, an event like this, for having published the Evaluation Matter publication, but don't stop there. Uh, we need to explore new ways of communicating these findings to to be able to, to be a credible voice in this um, uh, 
flurry of information flow. So it gives us a challenge to, to, um, to be much better in communicating. Um, Hannan, um, a, lot of, a lot of learning we've seen is very much, and, and I, think, I think you raised it, Caroline, as well, a lot of learning is really focused on the past. Now, I know that you're the director for economic forecasting, so the question that I would like to ask you in the context of you know, this general debate over evidence, uh, what is it that we can learn from the future, if anything? I get the easy question, huh? <laughs> well, it's just, uh, to make, it's just to make Caroline feel good. <laughs> Understand. Uh, so, um, learning from the future. Uh, well, this is uh, um, a really interesting question because, um, yes, we tend to, when we think of learning, think of the past. Uh, but um, learning from the future require really that you kind of uh, uh, requires that you think of uh, um, you know um, or prepare for the unexpected one and two uh, prepare for what you know is coming so uh, let me give maybe two examples that come to my mind um, one is kind of one that I th like, you know, I, I worry about uh, having, uh, you know, uh, done my doctorate in financial uh, crisis. Uh, one of the things is we're always there is always a new trigger. Like if you look like in the history, there is all it's not really the same one. Every time it's a new one that we haven't seen before. It has similar characteristics, but it's a new uh, problem. You know, like what happened with the subprime mortgage, uh, what happened even in the 30s with, you know, uh, uh, lack of separation between banking and investment banking. So kind of the next one, what, you know, what would happen? And for example, one of the fears is something like, you know, uh, a risk of cybersecurity. And how could this be a trigger for a crisis? Could it be uh, lead to contagion? And it can be, it doesn't need to be like a government thing. It can just be for a major systemic bank. So one of the things that we need to think about, how, you know, how ready are we? What can we put, what in terms of regulation, in terms of uh, uh, standards, how we can really kind of be ready if crisis hit and what safeguards are being implemented. This is one, a second one, is, uh, for example, the uh, fourth industrial revolution that is going on uh, and what it means for the continent. And um, I know there is a lot of concerns and fears of what it implies uh, uh, for the continent, but I tend to be on the optimistic side because um, it's much easier to build something from scratch than to adjust an existing uh, building, okay? So in a way, we are, the, the continent is still developing. We have huge, um, uh, uh, like, you know, um, health and education needs and so on. And what does this industrial revolution mean is that we can deliver in different ways. We may not need to build, like, you know, thousands of hospitals that we thought we need. We may need to uh, in, invest in um, technologies that we can uh, deliver these services without the fiscal infrastructure or uh, uh, find new ways of pro providing the education without building all these new schools. So in a way, I think it's more promising for the continent because we can use it in new ways than uh, countries that have invested in all these type of like, you know, uh, physical infrastructure. Um, but we need to also be ready to prepare these generations with the skills, with the setup, and with the thinking and strategies for the future. So that's my m my thinking about like how, what can we do for the for, for the future going forward. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah. And let, let me start by recognizing the presence of Her Excellency and say how much we're honored, Your Excellency, that you chose to join us uh, and resume the conversation. I think it shows uh, your dedication and your commitment uh, to, to evaluation. And let me just bring you up to speed where we were in the conversation. Actually, we started the last question was really picking up on something that you mentioned in your keynote speech when you quoted uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, saying in for the 1996 uh, census that um, a census is important because 
we need an accurate understanding of people's needs. And the question that I just put to the panel, we've just heard from them, it would be good to have your sense uh, also, is about the place of evidence-based um, policy uh, making. Especially, you know, as we hear here and there references to alternative facts, alternative truths, it seems to really undermine the case for making policy on the basis of facts, on the basis of evidence. I know this is something you feel very strongly about. It would be uh, great to, to hear your perspectives that you started uh, presenting to us in your keynote uh, uh, speech. Uh, and after that, um, uh, where I think we've got a few minutes, so I'd like to open the floor uh, once again to the audience for a last round. And then what I'll ask all of the panelists to do as we wrap up uh, this session is maybe to share with us, with all of us, the three sort of key important lessons that you've taken away from this conversation, from your experience in terms of what can make a real difference in our ability to learn from, a, from our successes and from our failures. Uh, Minister, Your Excellency, your views on, on evidence-based policy making, is it something that really matters or, or is just opinion something we can, good enough for politics? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think evidence-based policy is very important. Um, if we are going to uh, work on, let's say, immunization of children, um, you need to be able to project how many kids were born this year, so how many vaccines you need, but if you don't have evidence, you can run short of, or you can oversupply. Um, I think almost everything that you need to do, you need um, evidence. But also, uh, as we said, you also need evidence in how you are doing. Uh, how many kids have you actually been able to vaccinate, and so on. So. I'm just using that simple example, but whether it's school, how many kids are going to be starting school, you know if there are so many kids born this year, then you can plan that in six years or seven years, depending on when they start school, in three years, in two years when they start nursery, how many kids you are talking about, and, and so on. So, so I think also, evidence in the other way, what, what we are doing, what, what impact is it having, and so on. So I, I just think it's, it's an important aspect. Um, I don't think you can say, well, you can have it or not have it. I think you should have it. Okay, thank you very much. What, what I suggest we do now, um, and as we sort of wrap up, uh, we were meant, I think, to stop at half past 12, but uh, I think the fact that you've joined us, Minister uh, Karen, tells me we have a little bit of flexibility. Maybe until one, until one, is that, is that good enough? Okay, so what we can do with the time that we have in front of us is I think uh, there were many hands that were raised earlier on in the conversation. So I'd live, like to give another opportunity for people to make comments. Uh, comments are important, I, I think, just for the purpose of dialogue, uh, questions a little bit better. Uh, so I'd like to hear more questions than just uh, comments. And if you could just, again, introduce yourselves and make it as clear and as concise as possible so that we can take as many questions and we can give the panelists as much time as possible to answer the point. So the lady uh, over there, so I just want to make sure that I, I cover everybody. I, I seem to see people in front of me, not necessarily people at the back. So I've got uh, two hands, uh, three hands o over here, and I saw a hand on the left. So those are the ones that I'll be taking, and one over there. So five just five comments and questions, please. I urge you to make them as brief and concise as possible so that everybody gets an opportunity uh, to make his or her point. S'il vous plaît. Micro pour la dame. Ah, pour la dame, d'abord. Est-ce que vous pourriez vous lever? Could you please stand up as you make the question? I've been asked to, to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eskadar Nega. I'm heading a very small office of evaluation at the UN Economic Commission for Africa. And thank you for all this exchange that has been uh, very uh, enriching. Um, 
I have a brief comment on the uh, earlier issue of uh, learning and maybe a question I'll do both very briefly. Uh, the comment struck question uh, to all of us, and I'd love to hear from the uh, panelists. Isn't it our focus on accountability and reporting requirements that has put a bit uh, the learning issue in the, in the, in the back seat? Um, or our less appetite for learning from uh, failures? Uh, I think we have touched upon it uh, directly and indirectly, but I haven't heard really this linkages between accountability and learning coming uh, prominently from the discussion. The second, when it comes to uh, evidence and data, I believe that evaluation uh, is more than monitoring, is more than indicators, is more than statistics. I believe that we uh, provide a bit more uh, value addition to understanding what works and what doesn't work, particularly in a complex environment of uh, global development plans such as Agenda 2063 and uh, SDGs. Uh, how is it that we help each other to get this message beyond? Because my colleagues in ECA and statistics say, well, we are collecting the data, the statistics, and we are the ones understanding what is happening with the SDGs and Agenda 2063, and maybe bringing these two together also as part of the debate would be very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that question. I think you, you, you put your finger on something we haven't talked about so far, which is very important, which is accountability uh, and accountability in the context of evaluation. Uh, let me take... Uh, yes, the gentleman... Uh, OK, merci. Donc, présentez-vous, s'il vous plaît. OK, je me nomme uh, Peguin de Rodolphe. Je suis donc uh, membre d'un centre d'analyse des politiques publiques. Alors, ma préoccupation euh, est relative euh, à l'agenda euh, de, de 2063, c'est bien ça. Alors, euh, l'honorable, donc, a parlé, Madame Zouma, a dit que euh, les pays ont été invités, en tout cas, à implémenter, euh, donc, euh, les objectifs dans les plans de développement. Alors, euh, ma préoccupation est que, euh, en termes de vision prospective, La plupart des pays se donnent un agenda de 25 à 30 ans. Alors que la vision de l'Union africaine, c'est 50 ans. Alors, comment est-ce qu'on pourrait donc avoir une vision au niveau donc communautaire, au niveau donc de l'Afrique, de 50 ans, pendant que les États se limitent donc à 25-30 ans Alors, c'est ma première question. La deuxième question est relative donc à la qualité des données la sincérité des informations pour faire donc une, 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 seule, question, une seule question ah, vous dites? Une, une seule question papa une seule question je peux terminer au moins cette question s'il oui. vous plaît oui oui je vous en prie <rire> d'accord alors donc on ne peut pas faire un bilan quand les informations dont on dispose et les données dont on dispose ne sont pas fiables ne sont pas sincères alors c'est une préoccupation majeure dans les évaluations qu'il est bon de noter il faut trouver un système pouvoir assainir nos informations statiques au niveau des, des, des pays, au niveau des systèmes statistiques des pays. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Je suis Samuel Kwaku, vice-président de l'Association africaine d'évaluation. Je voudrais remercier les panélistes et surtout l'honorable Nzuma pour la qualité de leur présentation. Sommes-nous en train d'apprendre, je dirais, Comment apprendre et où apprendre Il y a quelques semaines de cela, une rencontre en Côte d'Ivoire a montré qu'il y a environ 350 projets de développement qui sont exécutés en Côte d'Ivoire. Lorsque je le rapporte à toute l'Afrique, c'est pratiquement pas de 20 000 projets qui sont exécutés au moins en Afrique. Je me demande, est-ce que la méthode d'apprentissage est la meilleure Les couleurs les webinars, peut-être quelques séminaires de deux ou trois jours, ou également aussi d'autres activités, alors que dans les pays où les projets ne se développent pas, notamment les pays du Nord, il y a des masters en évaluation, des doctorats en évaluation, alors qu'en Afrique même, où la plupart des projets se, 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 se déroulent, c'est seulement des, des formations qualifiantes de un ou deux jours. Je voudrais savoir, euh, enfin, est-ce que nos pandémies, notamment la Banque mondiale, 
et l'OCDE qui est en train de revoir les critères qui sont très fameux dans le domaine de l'évaluation, quel appui ces organismes-là peuvent nous apporter, notamment à l'Afrique et même au gouvernement, pour qu'on puisse vraiment aller accélérer en fait, les questions d'évaluation en institutionnalisant des masters en évaluation ou des doctorats en évaluation. Et pour cela, je voudrais vraiment solliciter son honorable Souma. Nous savons que lorsqu'elle était à l'Union africaine, elle a vraiment fait accélérer beaucoup de dossiers. Nous souhaitons que vraiment elle soit parole, notamment enfin, des paroles des évaluateurs, pour qu'au niveau de l'Union africaine, notre voix soit entendue et si possible au niveau de l'Afrique, les questions d'évaluation ne puissent pas attendre 50 ans, mais vraiment d'un peuple à venir, notamment deux ans, trois ans, on puisse vraiment avoir des masters ou bien de en évaluation. Merci beaucoup. Oui. Bonjour, mon nom, mon nom c'est Sek Pabdemba. Je suis évaluateur de, pro, de projet et programme, consultant et dirigeant au bureau d'études. Je travaille pour la BAT donc, depuis 1997. Donc depuis une vingtaine d'années, une trentaine d'années, je suis évaluateur. Ma question, le constat, c'est que pour l'essentiel, je me demande si on n'est pas en train de faire la même chose tout le temps depuis 20 ans ou 30 ans. Des débats sur les évaluations de projets, le critère, les approches, les normes. Ça s'applique à quoi Évaluer des projets pour voir si on a atteint ou pas les résultats. Mais est-ce que réellement on a fait des progrès par rapport à l'impact de notre travail sur le quotidien des populations africaines Est-ce qu'on a pu faire des, permettre de faire des avancées significatives sur les politiques qu'on est en train de mener Oui ou non Est-ce que notre travail impacte positivement sur le quotidien et le bien-être des, des des populations pour lesquelles nous le faisons. Parce que pour l'essentiel, je crois qu'on est en train de répondre à la pression des portefeuilles à, à, à gérer au niveau, par exemple, de ces institutions. Donc, je, je le sais, j'ai fait pour la BAD, j'ai fait pour le PNUD. Pour l'essentiel, c'est répondre, faire le maximum de projets, voir ce qui marche, ce qui ne marche pas, et puis faire de nouveaux projets. Je vous remercie. Je vous remercie, monsieur. C'est une, une excellente question. Est-ce qu'au fond, la fonction d'évaluation sert à quelque chose lorsqu'on a le sentiment que c'est un petit peu les mêmes leçons et les mêmes rengaines qu'on répète depuis 20 ou 30 ans Une bonne question. Alors, let me turn to the, to the panelists uh, now. This is how I suggest we proceed. We've only got about five minutes in front of us. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to ask you to do... Uh, If you have any reactions to what has been said, and a number of the questions were directed uh, to you, uh, Your Excellency, please let me know that you would like to, uh, I won't be necessarily asking all of you, uh, but I will be asking after this, all of you to share with us what you think are the three takeaways, the three important lessons that you've learned either through this conversation or in the course of your career that really makes a difference to, to learning um, and um, um, deepening in particular, coming back to the objective that is set out by IDEV, the impact, the development impact of organizations on development. So, um, some reactions. Um, let me start with uh, the, the minister, then you, per, um, are there any other hands up? Yes, Caroline. Okay, so three, three reactions from the panelists, and then I'll turn and ask you for your three takeaways. Per, do you want to kick off? Sorry, minister, and then per. Um. Well, one of the questions was directed at me, so I won't take uh, the others, about the countries having shorter uh, plans and the continent having a, a longer time span. I, I don't think there is any contradiction, because if you incorporate um, the priorities of the first 10-year plan into your plan, and then the AU will continue breaking down its plans into 10-year plans. But some of the issues that are in those plans are long-term anyway, even if you have your 10-year plan as a country or five-year, you will have to still continue with them. So there is really no contradiction in my view um, between having a, an AU with 50 years, no longer 50 years now, but 40 something years, and the, and the countries. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave the 
I, I think the issue of people who are to study evaluation, I think it's an important one. Uh, so I think countries, the bank, everyone who can um, assist in, in ensuring that kids, uh, our young people, are actually encouraged to study evaluation um, is, is, is welcome and we should do it, actually. Uh, I, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, per and Caroline, a, a number of questions, provocative questions, I think, uh, around the evaluating function. At the end of the day, are we repeating ourselves uh, for, and have we been doing so for many years? Um, and I, I think the important point, I don't know how much time we have to cover that, but uh, on accountability and the importance of accountability. Per? Um, do we have too much focus on accountability and reporting? Yes, we do. And that's triggered by our short-term perspectives. Um, short-term perspectives from uh, uh, countries like Norway, in our political environment at home, uh, what we're doing with de development assist assistance programs. Um, and, we, and this is a big problem. Yes, it is a big problem. Uh, and it triggers uh, 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 insufficient answers to the questions. What do we do with it? We have to live with it and find a way to also, I mean, there's an expression from um, uh, in this field called feeding the beast. So we have to give something, uh, give some information that's useful also in the short-term perspective without losing sight of the more thorough, uh, credible answers. Um, the other question about um, are we repeating the same things within evaluation without making any progress? No. I think we're repeating many of the same lessons, but we are making progress. Look in service delivery, in health, education, in other fields, we are making progress. Things are developing. And again, I like this 50-year perspective that the minister talked about. Let's look 50 years back. We have made considerable progress in many fields, but not necessarily when we look at six months or one year. So I, I disagree with the statement that we're not making progress. And I do believe that evaluation is playing a role in this. Thank you, Perk. Caroline, I, I saw you you're reacting as well to some of the points that were made. Uh, yeah. Your, your, your so thoughts. Let, let me first of all start out in disagreeing with Pear. I don't think that accountability is necessarily as bad as many people say. And to, to be honest, for the first 15, almost 20 years of my evaluation career, nobody spoke about that there was a tension between accountability and learning. It was understood as two sides of one coin because the learning is about how well did the project or the initiative, the policy uh, get implemented? Did it get to where we intended to get? Um, I think where things started to go wrong is when accountability got equated with blame. Whom can we blame for that it didn't work out? That has created this tension and is really hard to get out of um, the, the conversation. But it again has more to do with institutional context and whether evaluation feedback is taken as here's how we can blame somebody or here's what we can learn so that we can do something better when we do this project again. Um, in terms of uh, working with statistics, absolutely, these roles are complementary. We have very good relations with the chief uh, statistician at, at, the, at the World Bank. We're actually going to have a joint event in, in Asia next week, so um, absolutely, this should go hand in hand. We can reinforce each other. Uh, likewise, unreliable data. It's true, There's m most evaluations come back and say, oh, we didn't have enough data. But nowadays, there's so many new methods and ways to collect data and information. Um, it is much richer now than what we had 30 years ago. And I think we need to have the courage to think about what are the alternative sources that we can draw on 
and how can we collect information that complements that and enriches our, um, our knowledge. And the final point, and I'm sorry, Simon, I know you wanted to wrap up, but the final point on the institutions and, and degree courses in evaluation, I, I agree with you. It's, it's now much more common in, um, in, say, in Europe, in North America, Australia. Um, my, um, my sense is that if institutions like the African Development Bank, the World Bank, um, group would be uh, including this as they invest into uh, improved public sector management, as they in, uh, invest in higher education institutions and make it part and parcel of those programs. Um, that would be a much more effective way than evaluators trying to become implementers for these programs. As a matter of fact, IG does not have the mandate to do operational work. Very much, uh, Caroline. And uh, uh, yes, as we, I thought, as we wrap up, uh, I'm going to ask you to do something quite difficult. I, I'm going to ask you to to tell me in in just a few seconds the three things that you think are the most important when it comes to to learning and to make sure that we're we're we, we're competent at learning and learning from 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 the, from the past and even possibly from the future. Hanan, shall I start? Can I start with you, Pierre? Uh, you made some very good points. Um, uh, in the course of the conversation, what, what, what are the three things that y you take away? So the, the first one, and I'll take them from uh, my perspective as a, a member of the African Development Bank. So one, we are a project bank by and large. And so for, there are two things we need to do. We need to, and I think we're a good project bank. So we need to keep learning. I think we're reasonably good at it on how to do projects well and how to do them better and how to make sure they are uh, adapted to today's environment. But I think we need more to have impact and to generate results. And we need to move more towards the policy side. We're not very strong as a policy bank. And that requires, I think, much more learning, debate, engagement, and asking the right questions, having exchanges on it. And so that, to me, is point number one. If we want to move towards more results, bigger impact, which is really what all this is about, what development is about, I think we have to learn and grow institutionally and become still a project bank that's going to remain our core, but also more of a policy bank that can engage governments on sector reforms and policies, etc. Much and will need a lot of input in terms of evaluation, debate, exchange of ideas, etc. I take the point from Pair that uh, vice presidents like me need to need to take more time to engage with evaluators, and so uh, but the evaluators need to see also where the interest levels are. So engage me on some policy issues, and I'll give you my time. Engage me on formal reports, you'll have a bit more difficulty. But <laughs> so uh, that's a personal thing. And so uh, that's one set of issues. The second one, uh, I didn't speak on the data issue, but data is essential as part of policy making and as part of decision making for projects. And we have a lot of progress to do here. Data quality is uneven. Uh, data quality in Africa in general is not very strong. And so we need to get better at using data in our own decision making. And we need to get better at helping our client governments and other and private sector clients in developing data in their own operations for their own decision making. So I would really like to see much more in our project design, much more in terms of uh, data, in terms of evaluation, in terms of feedback loops. For example, I'm quite actively engaged on the road safety agenda, a big discussion, not a glorious agenda in Africa. The best way to get impact in terms of road safety is to report on the number of crashes and fatalities that happen every day or every week or every month. Because why? That then creates awareness of the need to do something. If you don't have that data, you cannot create this positive feedback loop. So I think there are, there are, there are a number of things that I, I took out of. Just to summarize, I think, uh, going backwards, uh, the importance of evidence and accurate data to underpin uh, evidence, the importance of dialogue and having the time to, 
um, to engage with others, and especially in the area of policy. And possibly the third point that you made was around that fundamentally, uh, this Af the African Development Bank is about uh, implementing successful uh, operations. Um, I hope that's an accurate summary of your own summary. Uh, but let me turn to uh, Hanan. Well, what are the three things that you, uh, you took out? So totally agree with all the points that uh, Pierre raised. Um, and uh, uh, for me, in addition to that, is the issue of what we've talked about in, in addition to the role of accountability of evaluation, bringing that advisory role more. And I think even like for my department, like us to do more of that. And I think in general, for the role of evaluation, you'll get uh, more mileage if you a company, uh, you know, have it as a partnership and uh, more in a way, uh, what was mentioned before, embedding to over overcome resistance and gain trust. Because that's part of like being successful at the end is that establishing the trust. Uh, so that's one. The other is uh, communication and transparency, I think it's key. Um, it's very important to, to be transparent. How are you doing these evaluations? What are the criteria to be transparent in the way you're reporting them? Um, uh, the, the more you can establish that you're impartial and objective, the more that uh, your uh, assessment will be uh, um, easier received and uh, uh, um, uh, kind of have likely to have more impact. Um, the uh, third issue is really learning more from each other, uh, both as IFIs, uh, as institutions, and also, in my view, uh, within the continent. I don't feel that there is enough learning between African policymakers, uh, both from successes and failures. Somehow, um, we tend to look for outside the continent, look at, I don't know, OECD or Singapore, look at some other countries, but not within. And in a way, actually, our uh, uh, learning from each other, we, it, it's more, we are uh, more in a similar situation, in similar context, and there is a lot to learn from each other that I think we need to encourage this type of dialogue among policy makers um, so that we can learn both from successes and failures. Thank you. Thank you very much. A lot, a lot of commonality, I think, with some of the points that Pierre has been making on the importance of dialogue and building trust on the basis of transparent and, and evidence-based evidence -based, uh, dialogue. Uh, Pierre, uh, your three points, your three take takeaways. And, uh... Not much uh, different, but uh, le let me come. Uh, leadership, uh, that we have leadership um, in our institutions that do have a vision, not only to do things right, but do the right things. I think that's essential for any learning and change. Secondly, dialogue has been mentioned. Um, uh, my concern is dialogue between evaluators and uh, the rest of the organizations, the uh, involvement, uh, dialogue, improved uh, conversations. And, and thirdly, um, I think we need to continue events like this to build capacity in various places, support um, our evaluation societies uh, uh, to do that. That's my three points. Great, and uh, Caroline, do you, do you agree this time with uh, Per or, or there are still elements of disagreement? It's good to see evaluators disagreeing between themselves. It's, uh, it's heartening. <laughs> uh, it, it is a part of being an evaluator to dis disagree with people, so. Um, no, I agree with many points made and I've been thinking about what else to add and I would uh, take away from, especially this event, um, the hunger for learning that is obvious by the presence in the room, the incredible participation. We couldn't even take half of your questions, which is really a fantastic sign of wanting to learn. Um, and then reinforce what uh, um, others have said about the importance of leadership. And uh, while I agree, Pierre, with its leadership and engaging with evaluation, it goes beyond that. Leadership creating the space and the culture to allow sharing of knowledge and, and learning um, and open doors, um, ver quite physically, uh, open doors, making people uh, talk to each other. Um, and it, 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 it does require quite an effort to uh, lead a, a institutional culture change of that nature. It's not easy, uh, but it is definitely worthwhile. 
Many thanks, and uh, I'd like to give you the last word, Your Excellency. Uh, and again, let me thank you for coming back and honoring us with your presence uh, for this uh, conversation. Uh, thank you. Maybe it's a disadvantage or an advantage to be last because a lot, almost everything has been said. But maybe I just want to say, for me, uh, one of the things that I'm taking away is that if you want to continue learning, you must have a, an open mind and a flexible attitude to be able to, to learn from uh, other people. Uh, I also think that institutions uh, must have a culture, but they must also understand that cultures are dynamic. They are not static. And the world is moving at a very fast pace. And so institutions that serve us or serve the people cannot, be, cannot have cultures that are, start, are cast in stone when the world and technology and many other things are moving fast. So there must be that culture in the institutions uh, themselves. And the third one, I think everybody, most people have, have mentioned also that you should be prepared to learn not from one set of people, but from a, a variety of people. You must learn from the policy makers, you must learn from the evaluators, you must learn from the recipients of the service, you must learn from, from, from everyone and, and not just one. And then also, as Africans, I agree with, and I'm taking that point away, uh, that we have an opportunity to use technology to leapfrog certain stages of development. And I think we must take advantage of that without forgetting that the fourth industrial revolution with its artificial intelligence and, um, uh, other, and uh, all the other things, that artificial intelligence cannot create. So we have to sharpen and, and, and develop the creative industries because the, the artificial intelligence can only operate and implement what humans have created. So I think that's an, an element we mustn't forget and just be going only with technology, but sharpening the creative side of human beings. Thank you. This has been an absolutely amazing uh, session, and I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being so generous with your thought, with your time. Uh, it's been a tremendous learning, a big learning experience uh, for me, and I'd like all of you to give a very, very warm round of applause, please, to, to our panelists. So.